guys, today we are looking at uh, required practicals. Um, this video is sponsored by the Oxford University Press who made the brilliant decision of getting me to write these four books for them. A big one for combined science and then little ones for uh, each of the separate sciences. And you will notice there are lots of its papers and post-it notes in these days because I'm going to take you through parts of them. But um, this video, hi guys, um, isn't just a cheesy attempt for me to sell books to you because that is literally just cheesy. Um, this is, um, these books, I spent about six months writing these books, I spent so much time reading loads and loads and loads of really really long documents written by the exam board, written by the government, loads and loads of documents which lots of people have never read before. And then I did loads of planning, loads of thinking, loads of talking to lots of other people. Um, and that is the work that has gone into all of these required practical books. So it's not just like, you know, I got bored one day, sat down and started to write a few questions. Um, it's not just like I've tried to write as many questions as I can on each thing. This is about focused revision um, from somebody, you know, who has spent a lot of time and effort thinking about required practical questions. And these are important because last year, after the um, after the exams, you know, pretty much the last thing you want to do is go and talk to your teachers and tell your teachers what the um, exam questions were. So what, what you do is you go onto Twitter and Instagram and sometimes Facebook and talk about things. And we saw that last year because... Um, when you guys came on to exam, a lot of the students, well, a lot of large student students rather, started ranting on Twitter about things. And I kept a few of them because I thought they were really good. This is where from like, I'm sure other people who do live streams now have to do fancy things like cast their screen, screen cast you share everything you want. I don't. So I've printed out bits of paper for you. So this is going to be like um, a little bit retro and things. But... These are some of the comments that students made last year. I'm going to put them up for you, then you can go and, or you can see my fancy nails, which I had done this morning. You can see me in the red sweater belt with this pretty, aren't they? Um, so you can see some of the comments, and it's kind of like, biology paper with carrots, chemistry paper with maths, I reckon there's a strong chance we'll have physics paper without equations tomorrow. I mean, physics paper without equations is unlikely, but it's talking about how the practical questions that came up last year were a little bit unexpected, they were a little bit weird, they weren't the sort of practical questions we'd come across before. And that was the sort of thing that, you know, started the process of writing these books, started the process of looking at the practical questions in a little bit more detail, looking at what the uh, government had said in a bit more detail, looking at what um, uh, the exam board's questions are going to be like um, in a bit more detail because it's no longer simply about just learning the methods like it used to be. You used to be able to pretty much learn the methods and then um, run down the exam and then get a good grade. But it's not necessarily like that anymore. So I'm not going to talk you through the super long and boring process that went into producing this graph. Um, and I know looking at graphs isn't the most fun thing ever, but this is like... Here is 50%, these are biology, this is chemistry, this is physics. You can see the average number of marks is like way, way below 50%. So getting less than half marks across every single paper, pretty much, apart from physics, physics is pretty good. Um, it's like people are losing loads and loads of marks on these practical questions and we really want to look at why that was happening. Now, the average student, and this is the scary part, I know I should probably learn how to do presentations on this, but I, I'm super busy. Look, here is the next bit. The average student is losing like 40 marks, between 35 and 43 marks on practical questions, and that is a lot, a lot of marks. Because if we look at last year's um, grade boundaries, you can see this is a 9, 9, 8, 8, 7, 7, 6, 6, 5, 5, 4, 4, 3, 3. There is 19, 20 marks between each 
of the grade boundaries. So if you're losing over 40 marks on practical questions, that's that's two whole grades that, you know, we're really losing marks on here. That can be the difference between, you know, 40 marks, you're jumping from a 9.9 nine to an 8.8. Eight. And that could be the difference between getting into the college that you want to, not getting into the college that you want to, getting to university that you want to, not getting into university that you want to. Sorry, cats are doing cat things. So these are a big, big jump. So there's like, the practical questions are really important because, yep, there are some separate sciences. Um, there are lots and lots of marks available here and they are not being picked up by students. You know, dropping effectively two whole grades just on one section of the um, um, of the syllabus is, you know, so, so much to do um, because you know, you've got a lot of other sections to do and you need to really really face them. So these books, big one for combined science and then three for the individual sciences um, are really really designed to help you focus on picking up as many marks as you can in the section relating to combined um, practicals. Now we know that 15% of the marks on the exam are going to come from the required practicals. Um, we know that, so that's what the government has said so it's going to be. But it is not just any more going to be things like, can you give me the reference for this? Can you, um, oh, thank you, you cannot recommend the practical books enough, they are so useful. Thank you, I spend a lot of time writing them with the aim of trying to make the books as useful as possible, so I'm really, really glad you're finding them helpful. Um, I can't remember what I was saying now. So yeah, that is what is in the books, because the previous style of um, questions relating to practicals that we used to have in the old exam was like, you know, here is the method, or here is a situation, how do we do the method for this? Here is a situation, how do we do the method for this? It's not like that anymore. Um, the questions are much more focused on skills as opposed to just remembering stuff. You know, uh, the exam board, AQA, and I've told you this before, um, have said, they've come out and said, just remembering the practicals is not going to be enough to get you those 15% um, those of marks in the exams. It's just not going to be enough. You have to be able to do so much more. And the other problem with students just remembering um, the practical that they've done in class is that not every class, not every school has access to the same practical equipment, not every class, not every school can afford the same practical equipment. So, whereas one class might do um, an experiment with light gates for acceleration, another class might just be putting tape on the desk and timing things as they go across. So just learning a method, the method that you did in class, or just learning the um, method from the AQA handbook, then that's not going to be, definitely not going to be enough, especially since there are so many different methods for doing things. What you need to be able to do is to take the um, methods and apply them to new situations. And we really, really saw this last year in the first biology paper where they asked um, the practical about osmosis. Just a little, don't, I'm not telling you what's on your mocks, but um, there is definitely, well, there's a question on carrots on osmosis in there. I'm sorry if you haven't done that paper for mocks yet. Um, and everyone freaked out because it asked about carrots instead of um, the osmosis practical that you did with potatoes in class. Now you might have done it with different vegetables in class, they might have changed it since they did it last year, but so many students just looked at the facts, looked at um, this practical that they were familiar with that they did with potatoes, and then they saw practical to do with carrots, and everyone really, really got stuck um, that they, um, yeah, or there was eggs in Trexler as well. It's exactly the same principle. 
um, and they really really got stuck because it changed ever so um, slightly and they couldn't do it. So what I've tried to do in these books, what I've tried to do in all my questions is put things into slightly unfamiliar context. So it's not like um, just asking you the same stuff you get over and over and over again in class. It's not asking you how to do this. It's taking you and changing the questions around slightly, putting things into unfamiliar context, which I know you're writing a load of books. I think I've written these books to make you feel um, uncomfortable, to put you into unfamiliar context, make things strange. Like it's just because I want you to get used to feeling like that, so you don't feel like that in the exam, because that's the worst place to have that as a first feeling. I want you to kind of like you know expect there to be some strange practical questions in there. I want you to expect to be some different practical questions in there. Um, so I read loads and loads of documents when I was writing these questions. I was really thinking about the strange and unusual things that are written um, in all these documents that I read, anything that stood out to me as kind of like, oh, that would be a really, really good question. Because the examples have to cover everything, um, everything, hey, Mrs. Bouchard, um, the practical questions, the example has to cover everything um that um is in the specification so we know that every single practical is going to come up over the course of five years we know that every single thing about every single practical is going to come up over the course of five years so that you know little things that they write in there are important even though they might not seem like it at the beginning now for every single practical you have to um look at the questions and you have to be able to take the method and rewrite a good method for that. For every single practical you have to be able to write a risk assessment for that. So, uh, uh -huh. chemistry, they've highlighted one of the little chemistry questions in here. No, that's biology. Chemistry is red. I should probably have worked this out by now. So one of the questions that I wrote in here is, it's all about the, the copper sulfate practical and um, making crystals, you know these beautiful blue crystals, it's a great practical um, and it's really really nice but one of the things you've got to be able to do here is, is to write a risk assessment for it and when we're writing risk assessments you've got to think about what can hurt you how it can hurt you and what we can do to prevent it hurting you. It's not just enough to be able to come up with a method, you have to think about the, um, the, the risk assessment. You have to be able to write a risk assessment for every single practical that you do. So it's not just enough to say kind of like, you know, wear goggles, um, tie your hair back, because those are just general risk assessments. You need to be able to write one of these, I hate this word, specific, specific to um, the practical that you're doing so you can't write about um, you know the problem with putting copper sulfate down the drain in a physics practical when you're talking about um, circuits because that's not a relevant risk so you have to write relevant risk assessments you have to think of alterations that you can do to the practical now I did find one of these but where where was it <laughs> this is the one here, also in chemistry. I should probably take these off while I'm going to get on the radio so you can see it. Put them up there. Good. So you have to think about alterations that you can do to your practical. So even if you didn't have um, access to all of this equipment in class, even if you didn't have access to um, like a simulation of this equipment, you have to know of relevant alternative equipment that you can use to do the practical, to improve the practical, to make the practical better. For example, when we're doing titrations, this is one of the um, chemistry practicals, instead of looking for a colour change with an indicator, we can put a pH probe in there. So this is a different way of doing the practical. So this is an alteration using a um, data logger to make things more turn for the post-it notes I'm going to get so so confused with things I want to show you. Um, this is an alteration to the practical to improve things, to make fire behind me. Thank you. It's just it's just over here today actually. Just here. Is that better? Okay, good. 
Um, yeah, you need to be able to think of alterations to um, practicals that you can do, and you need to, have to be able to do this for every single practical. And there are a lot of practicals. In my science, there are 21 practicals. And spiders on the wall of back. Thanks, guys. I imagine that ants will be turning up very, very... And a ghost. Oh, fire, spiders, ants, and ghosts. Brilliant. Um, so for every example, you need to have a method which you can write. You need to have... Um, um, a risk assessment that is relevant to the method and you need to have a, no I don't find the comments annoying, and you need to have um, alterations that you can do. The other thing you need to do for every single practical is to be able to work out the sources of error. So if you're doing this practical, where might something have gone wrong and then you need to be able to suggest alternatives so that you can improve it. So all of the skills here are also relevant for A-level and for GCSE. Um, the, the process behind this is exactly the same for A-level sciences as it is for GCSE sciences. You need to know all of your variables. You need to know what the controls are. You need to know how they are controlled. So if you like your control is a volume of something, how have you measured that? So you've measured it in a measuring cylinder. And why is that important? For example, in chemistry, it could change the concentration, it could change the rate of something. So you need to know what the controls are, you need to know how the controls are controlled, and you need to know why controlling that control is important. That really, really sounds like a horrible, horrible tongue twister. Um, you also need to know your variables, your dependent variables, your independent variables, um, how you're measuring those, um, how you're changing those. For, um, okay, that's a good question, I'll come back to that in a second, um, for each of them. Do you need, need to mention the variables if it doesn't mention it in the exam question? Really just depends on the question, but if it's talking about analysis, then yes, it's not going to hurt you really quickly jot down somewhere independent variables, dependent variables. Um, but make sure you get it right, because if you've probably done something wrong, then the examiner is going to mark you down um, for not knowing what you are talking about. Um, you need to know how to draw graphs for anything. So any of them that has um, really, um, anything that has like a common graph, so lots of the physics questions, lots of the, um, the chemistry questions, they have a standard shape of graph. So you should be able to know what that shape of graph is and then hopefully you should be able to, um, um, when you come to, if you need to draw a graph or sketch a graph in the exam, then hopefully you should have a vague idea of what the graph should look like. So that you know, um, so you know whether you've got it in the right ballpark, whether you've got the shape looking right. You need to be able to draw lines of best fit, so that is going to be, um, curved lines are best fit, straight lines are best fit. Um, I know maths is absolutely insistent that every value is a value, but in science we have um, a number of results. You need to ignore this, you need to um, not do those on your lines of best fit. Um, and even if your graph doesn't explicitly state that you have to draw a line of best fit, you do have to draw a line of best fit. Um, you need to know how to improve collection of results. So um, you could say like uh, they could give you a set of experiments and they could say what is wrong about this? Um, what could you do to improve the collection of results? Um, you could have something where they're saying um, this was the experiment that was done. Um, what is wrong with this experiment? How could this be improved? To make it better um, at a later date and at um, a different point. So I can't remember what all of these tabs are, what they um, what they're all for. So I'm just gonna go and have a look at them. And here is a maths question. Because um, there is the math specification and there is the science specification, and the math specification can be applied to um, any part of the science specification. So um, here is a really nice question, all about um, bacteria dividing. 
Um, and there is absolutely no way that your teacher would have time to teach you how to answer this question in class because it's not something that's explicitly mentioned on the specification. It's not the sort of thing that, you know, is going to be in textbooks or anything. It's just a question that I made up. And, you know, you need to be able to practice these sort of hard, unexpected skills because, well, chances are you haven't done them in class. Now, this is another question. And since I couldn't find it in the book, I just knew it was in there somewhere. So, I, I don't know if this is going to be the right way around or backwards for you. In circuit A, the current was found to be 14.8 amps, amps, and the potential difference was found to be 7.4 volts. If circuit B has a current of 9.2, find the potential difference. This is a wordy question, it's a maths question, but it's also just a physics question. Um, and I know lots of people could be confused about how to answer this, but it's just a ratios question. You usually divide it by the factor, um, divide it by two, so the answer is 4.6. Um, now, explaining it as a ratio like that is really simple, but having the question written out like that, well, it's not nice, it's a bit horrible and hard, but you've got to expect, sorry, I'm just throwing random bits on the floor, you've got to expect to have different things in the um, exam that potentially you're not used to, that potentially were a bit, um, you know, not really what you're wanting, what is um, not really what you're expecting. So you need to get used to um, all the different things that are going to come up. Um, for example, we know pretty much every single year, so many post-it notes, taking them all off. We know, for example, pretty much every single year and the number of results is going to come up. So they are in the book to get you really, really used to doing things. And we know every single year things about data collection are going to come up. So we're talking about um, resolution, we're talking about accuracy, we're talking about precision. Um, and there are all sorts of different ways that they can come up that these can be asked. I'm just going to put these over here because um, holding them is a really awkward angle. Anyway, the um, once the exams are over, the examiners write... Um, a, a report about the exams and they go through the, each question and they kind of like analyze what was good about this question and what's bad about this question and they do it on a national scale so you, you can get them to take it to your school but they're really really boring and they really but your teachers wants to read these um and what is really really interesting to me is the things that are done wrong or the things that are done poorly on a national scale so there are a few things that the examiners picked out about practicals that weren't done very well last year so the things that they um, picked out is that students were unfamiliar with the practicals it was almost as if they'd never done some of them before and there were lots of reasons this could be, you know, schools are very, very pushed for time. You might have only done the practical once, especially if you did the practical um, in the beginning of year nine and then you're expected to do an exam on it in the, um, at the end of year 11. It's really, really hard to remember what you've done. So you can either look back at your notes, um, maybe, although this probably isn't very likely, maybe your school would let you take photos of the practicals in class, or I have done the practicals and made videos for you. Um, they're all up there on my channel for you to go and have a look at. The other thing the examiners said that um, students nationally didn't do very well was naming the equipment, um, what was the use of this equipment, so why, you know, what is this bit of equipment called, why did we use this, what bit of equipment would be better than this bit of equipment, how could we change this practical um, with different bits of equipment or picking bits of equipment out of a list? So actually getting familiar with the equipment or um, why we're using the equipment, what the equipment's role is, and actually just the names of the equipment. So it's no longer just good enough to look at the practical method and follow the practical method and um, uh, follow the practical method and just be able to recite it. Um, that's not good enough anymore. What you actually need to be able to do is to be able to adapt it. 
Um, students quite often confused about what the aim of the practical was. Why are they doing this? Why are they doing the individual things? And then the other thing that I've seen um, definitely um, coming up a lot is students being able to write a valid method. So I had a student I was tutoring last year, she was great, um, we were writing a practical, a um, uh, method for the photosynthesis practical, and it was absolutely beautiful, it was absolutely perfect, um, except it wasn't a valid method because she'd forgotten to add any water. Um, and this literally was like three words added in, like do this in water, but without any water in the photosynthesis experiment it's really really hard to count the bubbles because you won't be able to see the bubbles and they won't be able to photosynthesise in it. The pondweed won't work if there's no water. So you have to be able to write a valid method. The other thing you need to be able to do really, really well is stuff we talked about last week, stuff we talked about like describe, explain, evaluate. Um, and this is all um, linked through to the six mark questions. It's linked through to your maths in science. There's no longer specific um, find questions which are just about practicals, which are just about six mark questions, which are just about maths. These are all really, really mixed up now. So um, you can have a practical which is also a six mark question. You can have a practical um, which is like a really, really maths question. You can have a practical which is, um, you know, evaluate question, describe question on lots and lots of different things. So Practicals are really, really different to the way they were last year. Oh, I've just seen one thing on my notes. Um, there was um, a question last year about circles. Um, and, you know, if you got a question in maths, a maths paper, which said how many degrees are there in full circle, everyone would know, well, hopefully everyone would know the answer to that. But that's a question in a science paper. I can't remember which paper it is in now, but that was in a science paper. Um, and it really, really threw everybody. So expecting maths, you've got things in the, in the um, practical questions could really, really be useful. Open Intuition Centre, I'm really sorry. I am so busy. I really don't have time for Open Intuition Centre. Um, this is, these are these books. Um, they're written for AQA because AQA is the biggest exam board. But the NXL practicals are basically the same. There are a few different ones, so these would also be good for NXL. Um, I haven't done the analysis or haven't compared them to a um, OCR or the IGCSEs, so um, I don't know whether you could use them for OCR. But if you give me like, give me into the weekend and I'll write like something and I'll put it on my website comparing all the different examples and all the different practicals so that it's really easy for you guys to look up. More A-level content, yes, so much A-level content, so, so much A-level content. Um, multiple choice questions for A-level biology and chemistry should be going live by Easter. Provision guides for A-level biology and chemistry should be live by Easter. Um, and then videos will be coming through very, very shortly after that. Um, yes, you can get a grade nine, just work hard. No, this isn't pre-recorded. I am actually just sitting here now. I'm kind of really, or I'm kind of right, I'm really, really glad it stopped raining because on my way out from school, I was drenched, horrifically, horrifically drenched. And the noise of the rain was so bad. Um, it's actually now really sunny outside, which I feel is kind of like the weather taking the mick a bit, that when I was walking back from school, I got drenched and now it's blazing sunshine it's kind of like it couldn't have been the other way around even though well the noise of the rain in the window would have been stopped horrendous oh nancy i'm so pleased well done you um yeah guys i still can't open a tuition center sorry um yes i i will make some more grade seven exam questions um I am busy writing so much at the moment. I feel like I've got like several projects going on. I'm writing this year's predicted exam papers. I'm writing geography videos. I'm writing chemistry multiple choice questions, chemistry origin guide, biology multiple choice questions. I'm so busy. And I'm also visiting schools and giving talks. I've already made the playlist down on the front page of my channel. 
last minute revision tips um just focus on the bits that you don't know i know nearly a hundred thousand subscribers do you have any celebrations planned i think i would just save celebrating for when the exams are over i don't want to li i'm literally working every single spare second to um prepare stuff for you guys um but i will i will celebrate when exams are over when everyone else is celebrating um I, I don't feel like celebrating 100,000 what of course can happen probably just at the start of the Easter holidays and I know that is like key revision time. Um, I'll probably do a giveaway or something, probably with my practical books because I have quite a few of them lying around. Anyway, what am I wittering on about? Right, what other questions have we got? So this isn't for A-levels of practical books that I've written but all the tips in here are relevant for A-levels, the practical um, the, the process behind the practicals are um, exactly the same. So the general tips can be used for A-level even though the books aren't. Um, I will probably get around to writing practical books for A-level next year. Yeah, I know finding motivation to revise is really, really hard. Um, this really, really scary thought is, what is it, the 12th today? First exam is the 15th, or the first biology exam is 15th of May, that is two months away. Last physics exam is what, the 17th or the 19th of June? That's three months away. So yeah, three months and it's all over. I'm really sorry. 15% of the exam is practical questions. Oh, balance of revising paper one and paper two. Well, paper one comes first, so you need to do a bit more of that. You have a month after paper one um to revise for paper two but you can't leave all of the paper two revision until after paper one is done um and sammy i'm really sorry your birthday is on the 15th of may this is like a really bad year to have it but like every other year that's a great day to have your birthday because it's really nice and summery you know you've got bank holidays either side so you can go do long weekends when you're in your 30s you'll be really happy your birthday's on the 15th of may oh my favorite science that is um chemistry definitely the best way to revise for practicals? That's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked. That would be to um, do as many practice questions as you can think of. Here are lots of them. Um, oh, right. I feel like I've been rambling on now for a very, very long time. So um, I'm going to let you guys go so you can do um, some other bits. Quantitative chemistry is loads and loads of stuff over my website, like this whole maths, quantitative maths, chemistry book. Um, I'm going to let you guys go so you can go and have a little break and then maybe try some flashcards or some past papers or whatever you're up to in your revision tonight. Um, I do love to know what you guys are up to in your revision, so please keep me updated with how it's going. I do love to see what you guys are up to and um, any mock results you've got or any mocks that are coming up. I absolutely love um hearing um um yeah i would show you a cat but they've all gone i'll show you a bobblehead replacement for a cat anyway i now literally am just completely rambling this is not good video so i will see you next week guys where we're going to be talking about a different subject bye